we're so lucky to have people share in their experience for this first opening panel today. These are industry heavyweights, great influencers, very much like yourself, and many will be well known to you. However, I do want to provide an introduction as I invite them onto the stage. It'll give them time to come on up. And um, this conversation, I want to have you ready because we're going to talk about 30 minutes on stage and then toss it out to all of you. So, so you're all CEOs. Congratulations. Um, and so we really want to start just really just going down, starting with you, Andrew, is that as a CEO, can you define what success means to you, especially in relation to your event organization or your company as a whole as the CEO? Yeah, look, I think for, um, for surfing as a global sport, um, we've got some different challenges to other sports around scheduling and use of the ocean as our sort of stadium, so to speak. Um, so I think a lot of our metrics around um, success are often um, determined by the quality of the surfing conditions that we have for our athletes to perform in. Um, so really success is also then driven by the locations in around the world that we put our events in. Um, and also more recently the, the Kelly Slater Wave Company where we're now developing Wave Stadium so we can sort of remove that element of surprise and conditions um, to help us sort of in that space of, of success. So. Um, you know, leading on from that is is audience engagement um, and, you know, audience reach, but for us very much audience engagement. Um, we're a very digital-centric um, sport because of the nature of our sport. Um, difficult to achieve the linear broadcast um, metrics, but our digital side of things is, is incredibly powerful and, and growing. Um, so the world of socials obviously played into our hands in that respect. But, um, yeah, so that engagement piece I think is really important. I, and also, obviously, profitability and sustainability of events um, and, and the other one is just community engagement as well um, and the impact that we have um, from a success perspective around communities that we go to all over the world. I think that's a really powerful point about events. Lovely. Can I ask you, when, when Kelly Slater came to you and said you wanted to do a, like an, a wave as a CEO, are you like, how much is that going to cost and are you crazy? How, how did you approach that? Because that's pretty revolutionary. Yeah, look, it's it's pure innovation. It's um it's certainly something. It's uh to see it in real life too. We've got one in California, um that we've built and we've run actually a world tour event in that. And it's actually a wave stadium. You can go there. It's ticketed, and um that's really changed the game for us. And yeah, I mean, I, I was approached last year about this role and the opportunity to be involved in that that innovation and chatting to Kelly about it and um, his vision for it. Um, he's an athlete, but. He's a real visionary and, and um, I think being involved in a company that has that sense of pure innovation, I think that word's you know, used fairly loosely but this really is that. It's innovation and it's new and um, certainly exciting and uh, it's, it's a long way down the track and, and certainly something that we're all looking forward to seeing what, what it can bring to the sport. That's excellent, very exciting. Now, Therese, uh, you've got such a long history. As a CEO, we also want to hear you know, the same thing. How do you define success in this position that you've held now for a while? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And I work with an organization. I have the pleasure of being the CEO of a 40-year-old organization that mm. exists for uh, LGBTQI people for diversity and social justice. Um, my organisation was started 40 years ago by a, a, a radical bunch of, of passionate people that took to the street and wanted to um, celebrate a Mardi Gras. And unfortunately, that night turned into um, a, an aggressive uh, a night where 56 people were arrested and there lies the famous story of Mardi Gras we call the 78ers. So 40 years later, and a lot of water under the bridge, and a lot of political turmoil, and a lot of discussion, Success for me is to be able to run an organisation where we are as relevant on the LGBTQI level in the political work that we do to an eight-year-old as we are to an 80-year-old. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that is, that's such a challenge when you look at, you know, how do we remain relevant to our 78ers in a world that's changing so quickly, but how do we embrace the younger generation where gender diversity is the first thing on their agenda? Um, it, it's, it's such a... a a political but it's such an emotional and social uh, engagement that we have to have with such a big range of people so success for me is that 
It, that is truly remarkable because you are a CEO of an organization, and of course, fiscally responsible. And think, but I just I think it's really admirable how you look at the community as a whole because sometimes when you represent a, a specific community, such as with the Mardi Gras, um, you can drill down and be very focused on that one. But to see that you're looking at the person who's eight or eighty, and people that identify as straight that participate that are affected by it but still keeping that core to the 78ers. It's very, very impressive. Thank you, Therese. You're welcome. All right, so Helen, let's hear from you. So really, how do you define success? Uh, well, ACBC Laura is a not-for-profit membership-based organization. We were established also 40, over 40 years ago, um, and our mission is very clear, to promote bilateral trade and investment between Australia and China, cognizant of the fact that China remains the key to Australia's future economic prosperity and one of the chief reasons why we survived pretty much unscathed the global financial mm. crisis in 2008. So what does success look like for us? Success is obviously increased trade and investment and that is continuing. Last year we had a record $183 billion in two-way trade. Well, excuse me, can you say that number again? $183 billion. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> that, that affects the economy. That wasn't all me. <laughs> we'll give you the credit today. And, but more importantly, the bilateral relationship has certainly hit some bumps in the road over the last two years and relations are currently strained, not assisted by our US uh, counterparts. <laughs> I take um, no responsibility. So <laughs> I didn't vote for him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a measure of success for us is the cooling off of the tension in the bilateral relationship because it's never pleasant to conduct business in a politically tense environment and there are very real consequences. If you just think about South Korea two years ago, the Lotte Group allowed the US anti-missile defense systems to use their property. The Beijing really objected to that. Uh, China had actually asked for South Korean goods to be boycotted and they went one step further and said, actually, um, Chinese people will not come to South Korea on holiday. The tourism industry in South Korea was decimated almost overnight. So we think China is our number one trading partner, but the, it's a fragile relation, not fragile, it's a strong relationship, but we cannot take it for granted. And there are real potential consequences on the services industry, which we can't take for granted. It's, it's really fascinating because as a CEO, there's a lot of uh, political discourse and things that are outside of your control that you still have to flow with. Do you find that challenging on, on some That's days? the most fun part of my job. Mm -hmm. So nice. we deal That's we great. De we deal with the Chinese government. We deal with the all levels of the Australian government. Um, and we are like Switzerland in some respects because we are all about promoting trade. Um, and I do believe that in currently in politically tense environment, business will find a way and the future of bilateral trade between Australia and China will be in the services industry. So that's mm. tourism, education, events, professional services, and th th that's why we need people-to-people -people connection. It's excellent, excellent. Thank you, Helen. Um, Andrew, your, your organization literally goes 100 miles an hour. So, so how do you define success of a CEO, as a CEO with that? Yeah, well, uh, to pick up your word earlier on, Laura, it's, it's showtime in 35 days when Melbourne hosts the opening round of the FIA right. Formula 1 World Championship season. But we also stage the MotoGP event and those sort of um, pilots, they go 350 kilometres an hour on a motorbike. So you, you think incredible. Daniel Ricciardo's uh, tough in a car that's carbon fibre, carbon <laughs> You know, if you're going down with kangaroo leathers down the main straight at Phillip Island, you, you are tough. But look, Sorry. what we're about, it's a bit like what you talked about, the, um, the Impressionist painting at Musée d'Orsay or the White House. We've got to create memorable moments. Mm. And success is about making sure people remember Melbourne, remember our events, are inspired to come back again because we're a once-a-year event. So you've got to give people a reason if they're a repeat attendee mm. because they're a passionate motorsport fan They've got to come back every year, even if the racing is perhaps a little bit passe. If they're a first-timer, they've got to go away and talk to their friends. So success, in a very simple term, is about memorability. It's about surprising and delighting. It's about being showtime. And Bernie Eccleston created something that is wonderful from a foundation point of view. And now we've got the Americans in to add that spice. Chase Carey is chairman and CEO of Formula One these days. He's the vice president and vice chairman of 20th Century Fox. Yeah. He knows about entertainment and that's what they're doing. They're moving it from a motorsport company to a sports and entertainment brand. And what we have to do is do that. Now, that's the entertainment side. And at the end of the day, there's a set of 
broad objectives. We're there to deliver something to the Victorian government. It's a special marketing approach that Victoria had a leading advantage on when it came into this space of major events back in the early to mid-1990s. And we've got to deliver economic, tourism, branding benefits, underpin a calendar of major events, but give civic pride and livability to the Melburnians and then in turn deliver strength and business strength so that the Australian and China Business Council, for instance, sees the real reason to invest in hotels and infrastructure. Mm. Then we're politically driven, so the politicians want to see, <laughs> you know, big, uh, big attendances, low cost to government, strong media sentiment and so on. And then, and then we've got all the things. You don't go to too many events where it says motor racing is dangerous, people can be killed. <laughs> so we've got to make sure that all those basics and success sometimes on the end of a Sunday is that a 30,000 seat grandstand hasn't fallen down, that we've fed 100,000 people successfully, that one of Australia's biggest pop-up events has stayed popped up, that sort of thing. So, you know, success is a variety of different measures, but at the end of the day, we've got to deliver something that, that the fans love. How many years have you been with the Grand Prix in total? Uh, this will be the 13th event. I moved there from the Commonwealth Games, and before that, I actually lived the dream working for an American company making pet food. So I moved from pet food into, <laughs> uh, you know, the world of Formula One and MotoGP. Nice move, nice move. Thank you very much, Andrew. Penny, how about you? As a CEO, how do you define your success when you go home at night after a good day at work? Well, for us at Tourism Australia, I mean, we exist purely to bring more international visitors to Australia, and my role really has two key parts, and there's a number of people in the room with, that would know this, but the first part is the business events. Um, it's, the, it's the specialist unit that sits within Tourism Australia, and our um, complete remit is to look at how we get more events inbound into our country, and that's really in the conference and association incentive space. So for me, um, that's an easy one. It's a you know, well, very well-known target audience set that we deal with, and we know that we're often competing against other destinations. But for us, we have to make sure that Australia has... I suppose the sex appeal, you know, there's, <laughs> there's um, again, everybody in this room would know that you have to get the logistics right and the basics right. We often call them the hygiene factors. So they have to be there, but their destination appeal has to be front and centre. So we spend a lot of time marketing Australia and then working closely with event agencies, both here in Australia and overseas, to make sure that that business is converted. So it's probably the most commercial part of what we do at TA. Um, the other side of what I do is more of an operational um, aspect because within Tourism Australia, we have about 45 to 50 events that we run every single year and they take place both here in Australia and overseas and we have to get them right. Mm. So we have to run those events successfully because the people that come to those events are our potential customers and that's more in the leisure space. But for me, on both fronts, it's keeping the customer front of mind. Because if we can deliver those events operationally in a sound and successful mm. way, tick, people will continue to buy more of Australian product and continue to come here. But from the business events point of view too, you know, that if we continue to market and, you know, really make sure our distribution strategy is rock solid, then we'll get more business to our country too. So it's a pretty, ha it's two hat process for me. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I really think it's, it's, it's incredible when you look at how many events you do, both in country and abroad. And I think it's wonderful how you emphasize the power of business events, which is, this is what this is all about. You're an ambassador for every person in this room at every conference you attend and create as you really show the power of bringing those events here. So thank you. In fact, everybody, every Australian is. Mm -hmm. So we've all got a job to do. Excellent. Well, you do it well. Thank you very much, Penny. Now, Damien. Uh, do you open with a joke? What do we? You know, I, the pressure must be enormous. It, look, it is, Laura, and <laughs> I, will, uh, I very much leave the committee, the comedy to the professionals. That's that's not really that, part of my remit. <laughs> well done, well done. So, Davian, you're the CEO, and that's no laughing matter. So, uh, tell me about your uh, your success as a CEO and how you really define it, yeah. especially because you hit on so many different people. Uh, yeah, uh, our, our organisation is entirely focused to delivering Melbourne a world class comedy event. Uh, and supporting and uh, building a strong comedy industry. So the festival is the main game. We are one of the three largest comedy festivals in the world, very proudly. Uh, what we do uh, year-round, so, so that's the main game, but year-round we run development programs, so supporting, providing opportunities and platforms and mentoring for uh, pathways for people to enter comedy uh, and supporting their, uh, their comedy. But you, know, you can see 
uh, world-class comedy any night of the week in Melbourne, so why do people come to our festival? It's about building uh, a really strong uh, event. Uh, you know, we, we, we proudly, you know, create quite a lot of buzz in the city. You really mm -hmm. do know that our event is on, um, which, is, which is pretty special. Um, we achieved really strong box office this year, so we achieved $17 million in box office this year. Congratulations. Um, which, is, which is really great, but it's, it's great for us, but what that actually is is the livelihood of the artists who participate in our festival. It's their main income, it's their, it's their hard work, so it's, it's really providing the right platform uh, for artists to succeed and artists, uh, audiences. Uh, you know, average ticket price is really low, so we want audiences to come, see their favourite artists, but also come and explore and, and identify someone new to see. So getting that message out, it's a huge program, helping audiences to find artists to see, that's what success looks like for us. How is the evolution of uh, where you're sending uh, your message to get through to that prospective audience changed as a CEO? Because uh, you've been as CEO how many years now? I've been with the festival for um, seven years. Yeah, so so over that time, you see different ways to deliver information about the festival. How has that evolved for you? Yeah, uh, look, obviously the the evolution of social media. We have a direct line of communication with uh, with our audience. Uh, they they ask us a lot of questions and we answer them. So um, what what we have is we have a large social media engagement, but then there's the compound of that, of all of the thousands of artists who participate in our festival. Some of those have huge mm -hmm. social media reach. So it's really providing the right the right information and tools for them to, you know, spend their $30 and come and see our festival. When they come to our festival, uh, you know, strong partnerships is also really important. So uh, when audiences come to our festival, they're coming to see a show. They're also engaging in drinking and dining. They're, they're, they're really engaging. Um, w w there's a real boost in our... Uh, to, to um, the local economy mm. um, with restaurants, bars, cafes, um, pubs during yeah. our festival. I think one of the best things you just mentioned is that on social media, people ask you questions and you answer them. I, that is something I think sometimes really uh, is left hanging out there when organ even companies and, and, and different events say, oh, send us your questions, and then you never hear back. Uh, so very well, well done. Laura, Thank can you. I just say, Dave, congratulations on having the first ever Mandarin language uh, performance last year for Darshan. That created wow. a real buzz in Melbourne. I think it was the first for the... Not the first, no, no, we have, uh, we have in language um, parts. So this year there'll be uh, uh, performances in Mandarin, Cantonese, English, uh, as well as in Greek. So there's, there's, all, there's, there's, there's a small part of the program and growing. Certainly a lot of the work that we're doing in Asia, we are now presenting a lot of programs in, in language as well, which is great. That's fantastic. Very smart. Um, so let's go down the line uh, again. Uh, we'll mix it up a little bit. But we all want to know from your, first, you know, we, we've talked about your success as a CEO and, and, and how you approach that, that great job. But uh, what about your tips for success? Can you share maybe three, four, five tips that you think um, really are helpful when achieving success at an event? Yeah, look, I think um, for us, uh, and look, any event is really planning. That's one of the most important aspects um, is a bit of a, a given. Um, I think the, the aspect of um, talent in terms of the, the people that you're employing in your you know, key roles within the organisation um, is really fundamental. Um, partners um, in terms of who you're working with, um, in terms of supplies, but also, you know, investors into the event through your, your various sponsors and so on in terms of the brand fit, but also their willingness to engage and their willingness to really bring the event to life. Um, you know, I was at the Australian Open Tennis uh, a couple of weeks ago and just the way those partners um, bring that event to life is, is really well done and, and congratulations to them. Um, I think for us it's actually how our athletes engage. I think um, surfing is quite unique in the fact of, you know, we've got superstar athletes like Kelly Slater and the, and the audience can get very close to them. If you go to an event, um, mm. you know, if you think about surfing, their training ground is the ocean. Um, and before the event starts at 8 o'clock in the morning or something, if you're a recreational surfer, you can paddle out there and surf with them and be this close to that surfer in the water. Uh, when they come through the crowd after a heat, there's no sort of... You know, the, the only thing they get is a security escort, but they literally walk through the crowd, through the people. It's sort of like saying, well, if you're at the tennis, you can go and have a hit with, with Roger Federer, um, jump in a car with one of the F1 drivers sort of thing. So you can actually surf with them. You can get really close to them. So how we engage our athletes to be really fan-friendly, um, not only at the beach and, and within the event, but also then how that ties across into the broadcast is super important. Um, the final one I'd say is, is just around execution. I think, you know, there's always talk about planning and strategic planning, but 
Um, a mentor of mine always said to me, the best plan or the best strategic plan will fail without excellent execution. Mm -hmm. So I think that aspect of just how you execute and the excellence in execution is really fundamental to the success of your event. That engagement's so critical in everything that you discussed. Um, all right, Therese, and you're, when, when is the next Mardi Gras? Uh, it's a week and a half away. Exactly. No pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> so your top five tips. Uh, top tips. Three. Okay. So I guess how to uh, remain within the noise of events. You know, there are so many festivals, particularly in Sydney, there are so many events. You know, it's mm. so easy to get lost in that noise. And I think we all have to step back that, that, that work in events and that work in festivals and ask, you know, well, what makes us unique? We, we've all done that before. We've all navel-gazed and looked at back at our organisations. Who do we exist for? We were in an interesting position with Mardi Gras of kind of losing relevance. Um, mm. And that's, a, it, it, you know, an interesting kind of phenomenon in itself. But, you know... Everyone wants to be a part of diversity, which is fantastic. So we are meeting our goals. Everyone wants a part of the pink dollar as such. You know, there's that conversation. So while we look at our festivals who are also being inclusive and diverse as we want them to be, what did it mean for Mardi Gras? What did it mean? How do we remain unique in that? So for us, it was going back and again asking those questions. Who do we exist for? Why would someone come specifically to Mardi Gras when they can see a diverse show anywhere? Mm. So for us, we went back to, to the roots of our organisation, which is embedded in human rights and social justice. And to cut a long story short, what it means for our programming now is every artist in Mardi Gras, every discussion, every event that you will see fits a criteria of human rights, social justice and diversity. And therefore, we can remain that unique festival that we are and it differentiates us from a Sydney festival which can be as diverse as it wants to be and we want it to be as diverse as it is but it still um, sits us up uh, to be unique in that space. So I think we all have to have a unique aspect to our events even though they're very similar to all the other events. Language is a really important mm -hmm. moment and Mardi Gras for the first time this year will be programmed in Mandarin on our SBS broadcast. We're also looking, we do braille books now for, for Mardi Gras so diversity and accessibility is a really big thing and people can come and get the braille books and read the braille program in Mardi Gras. We do a lot of Auslan interpretation, we do a lot of experience interpretation um, and language. We do, uh, now we're looking at Spanish, we do Mandarin uh, and there's another, uh, a number of other languages that, that we're broadcasting in on radio. That's fascinating and I think it's so neat that you, you know, you listed off your core principles of which you can always go back to and I think if if you, you know even as an individual uh, more or less an organization or corporation when you have core values that you can maybe check yourself against when you're growing or you're trying something different it really does keep you in check that's brilliant um, Helen let's talk about your top tips for success uh, well, success <coughs> for us, I suppose a top tip is to really know your target audience. Again, like uh, all the other organisations, the event space is very crowded and we have a lot of competitors. There are a lot of China experts out there in Australia. Um, the way we deliver our programs has changed. Uh, people are much more China savvy than they used to be. Uh, so we've gone, a lot, of, a lot of our information is now digital. People don't necessarily just come to business information events anymore. Uh, so we've changed our, uh, we change nearly every year how we deliver things. We do podcasts now to get to reach regional Australia. Uh, we also encourage uh, digital is not digital social media because Facebook um, and Twitter are banned in China. So for our mm. Chinese members, uh, we actually have, uh, we encourage WeChat, Weibo, and we encourage a lot of our members that uh, everyone in China is on WeChat. You need to have Chinese payment systems. Um, when they arrive in Sydney Airport or Telemarine Airport, they open up their WeChat account and the savvy retailer or savvy event organiser will have a pop-up that says, you have a 10% discount, come on down to Discount Chemist. I can tell you now, that Chinese tourist is coming straight to your way, way, way to buy some vitamin D, Swiss vitamins right now. <laughs> uh, or if they get a discount at some Chinese restaurant, they are there. So we... We need to understand our target audience and they are going digital and they're going Chinese digital platforms. That's fascinating. That's very well said. How many of you here use WeCheck or offer it at your events? Yeah. How many of you will now? <laughs> All right. Let's go with you, Andrew. Your top tips for uh, achieving success at your event. Uh, first one, let me start with a story. About three or four years ago, we had a leadership team meeting. There were six of us in it and uh, the guy who was facilitating some discussion said, 
what are company's values? How many of them? List them all down. Minimum we got was two. Maximum I only got five out of the six. It wasn't good enough. So it starts with culture and values and making sure there's a common platform and understanding aside from all the event side of stuff. And then more and more, it really is about the people we have. It's about the team we create. It's about the diversity we have in there. Um, when I started in events at the Commonwealth Games in 2005, it was very much that you had to work in events and big events in Melbourne only if you'd come from an events background. Mm. We've got levels of diversity now, people coming directly from government, they're coming from big FMC or G organisations, they're coming from other sporting codes interstate and overseas, they're coming from hotel chains and so on. So you've got to make sure you've got that collective wisdom because no single person, whether it's operations or marketing or the motorsport team, has a view and a complete correct view on what, what it's all about. Uh, thirdly, it's about the vision it's about attention to detail because of what I talked about before. I mean, you've got to have the vision of Bernie Eccleston, of Chase Carey, of Ron Walker, our founding chairman, and Joan Kerner and Jeff Kennett, who decided to put an event around a lake in Melbourne in the CBD rather than the out um, at a permanent <laughs> motorsport circuit where you would highlight the rooftops of a suburb. Mm -hmm. So you've got to do that. And then when you welcome them there, you've got to be able to successfully treat it as though you're hosting people at your home for the most special event you're having, like you did in, in the East Room at the White House. It has to be memorable, and that's a really big tip for success. Fourthly, I'd say steal shamelessly. One of the things at Mars, and I see lots of people writing them down now, is notes, is Mars has five principles. Quality, responsibility, mutuality, efficiency, and freedom. And the first one applies very much to Formula One and anything we do, and it's called quality. The consumer is our boss. Mm. Quality is our work and value for money is our goal. And if we keep those in mind all the time, we're very much going to deliver against everything we want to achieve. And finally, you've got to be fit, you've got to have fun, you've got to enjoy what you're doing and you can't take it too seriously because, you know, they're brutal campaigns, whether you're a week and a half out from, from the uh, Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras or, or you've got big events year-round and so on. You've got to have fun and you've got to enjoy work because we spend a lot of time at it in the events industry. Andrew, very well said. Yeah, the event industry certainly isn't like a nine-to-five job. It's a, it's a fabulous career that's 24-7 on, on most days, even when your event's not in the next day. So thank you. And thank you for also mentioning that events are more than just um, the physical and logistical setup. That is all part of it, and it's the foundation. But, you know, there's so much more to it that brings it alive than just the right stage or right screen or right AV system. It's, it's, it's all of that and, and more. Thank you for recognizing that. All right, Penny, your top tips for a successful event. Very similar and to the others. Lot. Absolutely, and I think for me, team is critical. So obviously, um, so many of our events are different, but find the right team members to do the right components of each um, different job for the event. Um, I'm big on the likability factor. I want our team to connect and act as a united front, and I want them to you know, portray that energy and that feeling for everything that we do. And um, I think from um, a leadership point of view, really important that we take people on the journey because, again, some of these events have got so many particular components. And if anyone um, is just single-mindedly focusing on their one component, then that united um, synergy won't occur. So it's really important they understand that. Thanks for taking us on your journey. Uh, Damien, yourself. I think what's core for us is the audience perspective. So building an event from how an audience is going to engage at every touch point from when they're first uh, through promotions right through to how they're walking into our venues. Most of the venues we build, uh, so it's not just like we're walking into a theatre and turning on the lights. So, so really um, focus on audience engagement and the audience journey is really important to us. Um, preparing for all risks uh, is also a, a core focus of our organisation. Prepare for the worst and, uh, and, and you're ready. Um, Strong teams is is very important. So we are really lucky. We have uh, a largely a contract-based short-term workforce, but we're lucky in that a lot of our, our team come back year on year. They go and uh, engage in other events and other festivals in Australia or around the world. So there's you know th th a strong culture, a strong uh, culture of sharing information, sharing ideas, supporting people uh, to have ideas, back them up to deliver them, uh, being really open to that communication and building that strong team. Uh, developing strong partnerships is absolutely yeah. crucial, whether they're strategic government relationships, corporate partnerships, uh, or, you know, any kind of partnerships. So uh, the, the stealing of ideas, you know, it's about maintaining the network uh, of, uh, of sharing ideas, sharing successes, and also sharing those failures. 
Well, you talk about the partnerships that are so key uh, to the pivotal success of any event. Um, we'd love to ask Therese, how do you balance really the less commercial but equally important aspects of making you know, an event successful with diversity and equality and youth development and the arts um, by keeping in mind the all-encompassing financial bottom line? We work with a lot of corporate partners um, at Mardi Gras. We have a criteria that corporate partners have to fit into um, and uh, we interview corporate partners. We, they, to be a corporate partner at Mardi Gras, they must have a diversity um, model, they must have an interpride network, and they must authentically align or work for change or good in the LGBTQI space and diversity. Every single partner that we work with does. I'm sure every partner in this room also is looking at diversity, also looking at um, inclusive um, spaces, looking at um, inclusive work environments. It's just part and parcel of what we do now. Um, balancing the, 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 the corporate dollar with the, with the ticketing income, the, the, the most challenging thing we have to do is diversify our income. So we can't lock up all our, all our money in corporate partnerships. We've got to diversify that. We also have to look at a philanthropic income for our events. We have to mix that up and put it in different pots. I mean, you can be in danger if you've got, you know, five or six big partners, the environment can change and you can lose a partner. Contract aside, contracts are worth nothing in an environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. Your partner will walk away. So that is, the, the, you know, a really important thing. And also to use that corporate money for good. We channel... Um, a lot of our corporate money now back into community. We have a community grants program that's a national grants program and we work with big, big corporate partners like ANZ, like those big corporate partners where we funnel that money back. Um, so I think it's about that discussion that you have with your corporate partner and really funneling and understanding exactly where that money goes, dollar for dollar. You're not just taking that corporate money and putting it into your infrastructure or your operations. You're watching where that money goes and you're able to report on that. Um, and there are, there are no funding bodies or, tr or foundations or trusts for LGBTQI development in, in, in regional areas or national areas, and it, it is gobsmacking that there isn't. So we work with our corporate partners to make that change. Um, and this is the, we're two years into that program, and we're starting to see significant changes in the tiny, small little environments like the Tiwi Islands. We were able to bring the Tiwi Islands sister girls to Mardi Gras through a corporate partner engagement, and it changed the 10 transgender Tiwi Island girls, it changed their lives and it would change their lives forever the moment we did that. So this is where corporate partners for Mardi Gras become the social engagement. And I love how you call them partners, not just sponsors. You know, how it's a true partnership, mm -hmm. yeah. And we give and get as much as we get from each other. And we challenge each other. And it sounds like you really have great tools for those inside your organization that are responsible for raising money. Because how do you keep people excited about <laughs> raising the funds? It's sometimes a tough thing to do, like you said, if the environment's not quite right for it. How do you keep them engaged internally to go ahead and get one more partner on board? Well, it's about um, profiling the social, um, the social campaigns of those organizations. And we don't do it through brand recognition. Our biggest challenge is moving that brand away. We're getting rid of the logos. And success for a, a partner for us is we want you to be on our parade without one logo on your float because we will tell your internal story through social media. And once we start to tell those internal stories of what you're doing in the LGBTQI space, you'll become more recognised, more accepted in the community. It's a big struggle to get rid of those logos. And anyone yeah. that works in the sporting, anyone that works in the sporting <laughs> environment will go, you're mad, that'll never support. happen. <laughs> Um, the logo war is, you know, is big, but we, we are making that happen. And now you'll see A and Z go down our parade route. The logo will be small, it'll be there. But the way that they creatively engage with their, with their story through, through, so, through social media, telling the, the one story that A and Z um, really put them on the map was it told the story of a transgender worker um, that was in, um, uh, from Thailand. And it, they told how they worked with that transgender um, staff person to be able to recognise a name to get a bank account because when transgender people, th they have to change their name to get a bank account. So ANZ was the first to do that. So instead of a logo, we tell that story. We tell the story of their, of their inter-pride network and that's how we keep them engaged. 
That's incredible, because uh, event planners, producers, and every realm of it are true storytellers. So thank you for telling those stories. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, we've got some great mic wranglers in the audience. Just raise your hand. They'll bring a microphone over to you. And if I don't see you, just shout out. Um, now I'd love to ask uh, Penny. You know, you, um, you hold events throughout Australia. Um, and you really expose international audiences to feature different cities and, and regional centers. What's your relationship between events and between like a, somebody that's an events and tourism manager and an event manager for Tourism Australia? What's, your resp what, what's sort of your partnership that you have or the partnership you want to build with those event managers throughout the country? You won't have to be across all of this because you live in the United States, but we have this wonderful thing called federation in our country. Um, and so as far as Tourism Australia is concerned, we as a national tourism organisation sit at the top of, if you think about a simple sales funnel, it's our job to create platforms and, and obviously then that drives visitation. But when we do do events throughout the country, we'll partner with stakeholders. Now those stakeholders for us are state and territory um, tourism organisations or convention bureaus and then we'll organise um, the event top line but always engage event industry members, whether or not that's audiovisual, um, production, um, creative theming, um, keynote speakers, uh, you know, direct venues, etc., etc. So as many different tiers to it. Mm -hmm. And so for us, again, that partnership, which everybody's been talking about, is critical because we're all trying to achieve a great event together. So that's generally how we work within TA. Well, and really, when you look at like the reverse, like the two Andrews, um, how is it for you working with Tourism Australia from the standpoint of your creating the event that promotes obviously, you know, Melbourne where, where the motorsport is, you, you change around different areas. How, how, what's your relationship like with Tourism Australia? Yeah, look, our, our relationship is more uh, centric around the states where we run those events. So we have a, a relationship with Tourism Western Australia um, for our Margaret River World Tour event um, with TEQ uh, Tourism Events Queensland in for the Gold Coast event and then Visit Victoria uh, for Bells Beach and certainly our events definitely have a um, you know a, a story to tell around the locations they bring to life because they're not the stadium is the ocean and that region and so on um, you know the Margaret River uh, event is a great example of that where it's an absolutely stunning coastline a beautiful area um, there's more to it than just waves there's wineries and caves and you know it's a great place to go so we try and tell that story um, and working you know closely with those organizations to achieve that mm -hmm. do you find the same thing true for for your area as well andrew yeah i think i pick up the word visit victoria we, we're a state-funded body but i think what uh the role of all of us in the room that was mentioned earlier on by petty we all have a role to play is that we compete on a global market and every one of our events needs to stand up in the Asian region or on a global basis because people have choice, they have the ability to travel. So our MotoGP and Formula One events are competing against the desires of people to go to bucket list locations like say Monaco or Monza or in the region. They could go for everywhere from Suzuka, Shanghai, Malaysia for MotoGP, Vietnam's coming on board or Singapore have a wonderful night race in, um, in their part of the world. So what we've got to do is we've got to have the level of excellence, not only in the event staging, but the experience across the infrastructure, the end-to-end -end solutions, their ability to get into the airports visa-free or with lower costs and so on, has to be better than the offerings they're getting elsewhere. And that's where Tourism Australia probably has a very strong lobbying approach and a level of responsibility to continue to integrate the events because that then promotes people who either come to Melbourne to see directly the event or they might go to other things and then come to the event after because it's on. Either way, they're extending their stay, whether they're going to Bells Beach, the Mardi Gras or other things, they're a reason to come to Australia over going to somewhere else in the world and, and they play a big role and I think it's got to be leveraged possibly more. Th that's very interesting. I have to say, as a, an American citizen, when I come to Australia to speak, whether it's Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, which are the usual stops for me, I always add on an extra week, uh, say for this one, I've got to run back to the States. But I think it's so wonderful. You spend all that time and resources getting here because yes, and, and oftentimes it's, it's listed as a challenge because y you are a long distance for many people to travel. But what a great positive of it because I'll spend another week and a half spending money, hotels, services, and just and seeing the city more than just where I might be localized.
Absolutely. And there are two types of visitors. There'll be the diehards that will follow the Grand Prix circuit or the surfing mm -hmm. circuit. And they'll come for that and then hopefully extend, which is what our job is to do, to try and promote that. Or the reverse, that they were coming to Australia anyway. And then they'll tap into what's going on. Damien, do you provide different resources um, commercially for the comedy festival uh, to make it uh, not only about comedy but stay for the city, stay for the region? Very much so. We work really closely with Visit Victoria. Uh, comedy is one of the core pillars that Visit Victoria is using at the moment. Uh, Humour, certainly. Uh, what we find, uh, we, we, we do draw audiences from across the Asia region, but when it comes to uh, visitors from other parts of the world, it's about extending their stay when they're already here. Uh, and, and we see quite a lot of that, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, similar to the question that we asked Therese about uh, the commercial aspect of it, the, the bottom line, uh, motivating to fundraise and bring out more partners, is that something that's uh, become easier as the festival grown, has grown or have you found other challenges? Uh, sponsorship is certainly a challenging market, mm -hmm. uh, very much so. It's always challenging. What we uh, certainly have delivered over the past couple of years, more so than in, in the past, is uh, deeper partnerships, so very much activations, uh, pick up on the point about logos. Logos are not so important now. It's about how we're engaging uh, with the um, you know, with the clients, the customers of that business, and how we can uh, extend that brand in a, you know, put the brand in the hand, have a real tangible. We we do create, uh, a, you know, we have a physical presence, obviously, being an event. So how can we, how can we really deliver on that? So, so activation is very important, as uh, is content. Uh, when it comes to comedy, every every uh, partner wants content. <laughs> well, I really like that keyword activation. Uh, you seem to do that throughout it all. Um, again, any questions? We've got some popping up here, so please uh, make sure you use the app as well, and you can submit your question. Here's one. Um, all of your events are successful on the international stage, and that's true for all of you. Uh, what do you see are the branded barriers for Australian events in the global marketplace? Um, you know, Helen, you see this from the perspective of China. What are the barriers in Australia for holding these events? We are far away. We're expensive. Uh, we don't have the same digital platforms which the Chinese want when they come here. We don't have their payment systems. Uh, and we don't speak Mandarin. And there are sometimes not culturally appropriate menus. We don't have cult culture, like late night culture for eat for dining. Um, so I've got a long list, Laura. Um, <laughs> but That's why we started with you. <laughs> we've got a better one. So we're understanding the Chinese consumer more and more. I mean, we had 1.4 million Chinese tourists that came to Australia last year. We did a report on Chinese tourism and we projected that by 2026, we will have 3.3 million Chinese tourists come here. Mm. But we are not infrastructure ready for what is coming our way. I mean, apart from the nightmare of the Sydney airport, um, we don't have enough hotels. God, I was talking to the uh, Parks Victoria CEO and she said we don't even have enough toilets on the Great Ocean Road when they go to Apollo Bay to visit the 12 wow. Apostles. So sewerage, infrastructure, language proficiency, culturally appropriate menus, culturally appropriate activities, we need to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. I still love coming here. Well, yes, exactly, but it shows what you can do. You know, it's, it's never going to end, but those are all really key basics to, to build If we can solve parking and toilets, <laughs> I, I think we've solved the world. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. I mean, the Great Ocean Penny. Road is one example, and I know there's a body of work going on to address that. But, you know, I think we've come an incredible long way with um, China, and, and I do um, know that not everybody is market ready, but there's been a tremendous amount of infrastructure development, um, unprecedented, actually, when you think about what's going on around the country. Um, but also, um, you know, they do want to come and they do want to have great experiences here. I mean, the numbers are staggering on China at the moment. There's even some um, conversation that's going around in the press about the fact that numbers are down. Well, they're not down. Um, the Chinese market has grown 46% um, over the last five years. And um, numbers are still up 6%, spends up 12%. They're still coming. They do want to... Um, experience all that we have to offer and it's just that we need to keep catering for that market while we still need to keep a balanced portfolio of other markets because Australia has multi-regions that are interested mm. in coming here and we need to be appealing or, or maintain that appeal for all of those 
all of those regions. And, you know, Andrew, with the Grand Prix, you've got, you know, the, the motorheads, you know, the ones that follow the sport and come through. But it, it, as you grow the crowds uh, and become more inclusive from around the world, just with the dynamic that it is, have you seen barriers um, that you've had to break through uh, outside of infrastructure? We don't see terribly many barriers for the Formula One Grand Prix in Melbourne because it's so close to the CBD, mm -hmm. the traffic and infrastructure whilst they're coping um, is being added to and the Victorian government's very cognizant of, of the need to keep investing. But in a regional location, and I think it probably applies to the Bell's Beach Easter Classic in the same way that MotoGP d is it down at Phillip Island. You know, it is becoming a very popular destination from an ecotourism, the penguins and motorsport. Now, people, the motoring industry, um, despite sort of the preconceptions, is a very well-heeled industry. They're very educated, they've got lots of money, and they like to travel. Um, but when they come down, there's either got rental accommodation, a very sparse number of, um, mm. of hotel accommodations, which tend to be snapped up by the international teams and a huge contingent right. of media, and then you're left with camping or not terribly many other options, like daily travel via helicopter. The need to invest in regional locations, like the the um, Ocean Road area and the 12 Apostles and other things. I mean, Tasmania, I think, do it really well. But where we lack is in somewhere like Phillip Island, where there needs to be investment and adjustment to planning regulations to get luxury accommodation and accommodation across, across a, a wide variety of um, pricing uh, options. I have no doubt you're one of the lead lobbyists in the area, so <laughs> well done. We've got a question from over here, please. Hi, my question's for Penny. Penny, my name's Paula. With the, um, what you've done with Modern Family, Oprah, Chris Hemsworth and bringing, doing all of those campaigns, have they been successful in bringing not just um, FIT to Australia but bringing more business events to Australia and therefore being able to use the Australian uh, events industry and our suppliers to benefit from that? Sure. We can't claim Modern Family. That was Destination New South Wales. But um, Oprah definitely. And in fact, um, the United States is in a, it's a very high yield market, particularly in business events. But even in FIT, we, we classify our target customer as a high value traveller. So they have the propensity to travel and have got the money to spend. So the barriers of time, distance and cost are a consideration, but it's not the be all and end all. So we've done a huge amount of psychographic um, analysis on those types of customers. And certainly those major campaigns help. And we've just, you know, a year ago, just this week, we did the Dundee campaign. It's been really interesting to watch that because of course, you know, you get that kind of exposure at the Super Bowl of 100 million plus people watching it. But then we need to do a huge amount of work with our key distribution partners in that market to make sure we're getting them to, you know, think about booking. It's, it's that lag between the consideration and then the actual booking. From a business events point of view, we leverage those campaigns too because, you know, most people like Chris Hemsworth. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, we roll him out as much as we can do. And... Um, you know, it's not just those superstars, it's all about advocacy because we can bang on because we're passionate Australians about how much we love our country and how great a job we all do um, every day in, in this sector and beyond. But if we can actually get other people to advocate for us, and so even in China, for example, we have people that speak highly about um, what it is that we do and why you should come to Australia. So yes, those campaigns are important for sure, but not the be all and end all. I like that. It goes back to Penny converting everybody to an ambassador. Yes, let's have a question right from here in the center of the room. Thank you for that. Good morning. My name's Matt. Uh, more a question for Damien and Andrew, I think. We've seen a huge expansion away from core events, particularly in public sporting arenas, towards creation of uh, almost a true entertainment experience. The Australian Open is a really good example with building a stage off to the side and getting the likes of Craig David out. I'd be interested in your reflections as to where that's come from and what future you see in, well, particularly Grand Prix. Is that something you're thinking about as well? It's not just a race anymore. Yeah, Matt, it's, uh, you know, it started off as being a race and, and a broad, actually, we've always had a focus on entertaining the customer. We're the only four-day Grand Prix in the world. Most of them tend to be three and most of them don't tend to have much outside Formula One in in Germany, for instance, it's Formula One and um, eight hours of nothing on the track. So we've always had a full day of track activity and um, we had concerts in the early stages. And in 2008, we brought Kiss along because uh, we were 10 years, 10 years young. 
and or 12 then, and we were really suffering from a reinvigoration need for the brand. And so what we did was moved into big music, big concerts and so on, and it's proved successful in many other events. But then we moved away from that to family entertainment across all four days. Mm. So we then moved into a line activity with Nitro Circus, Krusty Demons, Tony Hawk from a skateboarding point of view, and entertainment that could appeal to the families. Now what we're finding, and it comes to the partners, and it's not so much activation, business partners, they can all go to sporting events, comedy events, functions, and so on, but they now need to integrate it more with business activities and things that are going to leverage off dare I say it, the networking word and so on. And we're finding now that Formula One, because of its platform of technology and innovation and the, the marvelling of a pit stop, I mean, there wouldn't be a person in the room who doesn't marvel at the ability to change four tyres in about <laughs> a second and a half, and the Williams team is targeting one second. So continuous improvement and business conferences and activities are a way of life, and they're the sorts of things that we're now focusing on because they provide value for the Victorian government and our key partners, and it's a, it really is a competitive uh, scenario in Victoria. I look at what the uh, spring carnival does, the football does, the cricket does, the tennis does, and we're the last cab off the rank, and we have to better them all from an experience point of view in a temporary park that gets built um, whilst it's still open to the public. So there's challenges, it's competitive, but you just gotta be better than the locals, and you gotta benchmark yourself locally, nationally, and individ in internationally. Mm -hmm. How about yourself, Damien? I, I recently read something that the uh, Australian Open tournament director said, director said, where the Australian Open is an entertainment company, not a sporting event. And, I, and it's really true. It's such a, a, an incredible uh, space. And, and I love going there just to see uh, people engaging in a, a whole range of things. Of course, tennis being at the core of that. Um, what we uh, have developed a couple of years ago, it's slightly different, but what we developed a couple of years ago is a program called The Very Big Life Out, which is a free family outdoor program we've presented across uh, Easter, holiday, uh, and all weekends. It's largely nonverbal. It's physical theatre. It's, it's circus. Uh, it's it's stand-up comedy as well. Um, what we found is that it attracts a really large uh, uh, international student audience and a really large uh, audience of international visitors. And when we surveyed those, those audiences, we found that one-third of those... Uh, people who attended from non-English speaking backgrounds had not intended to buy a ticket, but then went on to buy a ticket to the festival. So there's a real crossover by creating something that was we designed it for for families uh, uh, and and young people as a as a way to provide a, a a really high quality first comedy experience. It actually had other benefits for our for our event, which is great and comedy generally. Wonderful. Thank you for that question, Matt. Um, now we've got one through the app again. Um, let's ask this. How do each of the CEOs here on stage engage your teams and staff to walk the talk, to stay connected and passionate with their staff, your staff, to get those successful outcomes for the business? How do you get people to walk the talk, Andrew? Um, oh, look, I think it probably comes down to leadership style and how you want to work with your teams and so on. Um, in terms of um, connectivity, I, I'm really big on making sure that we have a lot of open, honest conversations and we connect as people, that, that it's more than just a how's the weather, that we actually have a genuine interest in each other and care for each other. Um, I've actually implemented something that I learnt. Um, I did a course at Harvard Business School a couple of years ago in authentic leadership development and um, one of the takeaways from that was, you know, embracing vulnerability and, and really opening up with your people. Um, but also this notion of, of understanding each other and using tools to be able to do that, to connect. Um, and one of those is called Triple H, which is sharing together with your team your hero, hardship and highlight in life, um, which is actually quite challenging for some people. Um, but let me tell you that the impact that has um, on connectivity and driving passion and people actually showing up in, in a sense of um, genuine care for the role and for the each other is extremely powerful so um, if, if you know try that with your teams and it can be confronting but pretty powerful as well wow hero hardship and highlight that's magnificent Therese um, how big is your team to start with and then how do you engage them to, to walk the talk uh, through the year we're a small team of seven and we grow to a team of about 23 and we have 1,600 volunteers every year so <laughs> amazing just, it's a, a phenomenon um, the core team um, of, say, you know, 8 to 12, we go down a rabbit hole. Every year we go down this rabbit hole together and we are so closely bound in that rabbit hole that 
you know, we have to flatline our hierarchy. Um, and the other thing is we are all there for a passionate cause to, 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 uh, for diversity and social justice. So it's about recruiting. When we're recruiting the team, we're making sure that people are there for their authentic self um, and also that they're bringing all of this, all of themselves to work. You know, that's such an important part of someone's mental health and their social journey and their development in any workplace. Um, you know, we, we all go to dinner together. That's, oh, really? That's one thing that we do um, every month. We will go and, and, and have a social drink or we'll go to dinner. But I think the most important thing is we employ really great people. Let them do their job. Mm. You know, micromanaging is the, the worst and I, we see it all the time. We've all been micromanaged ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's employ great people, let them do their job and step in when you know that that's slacking off. Give people rope but not enough to, to hang themselves as the old saying <laughs> goes. I like that, that, that really allows you to empower everybody to be their best self and, and to walk that talk. Even when they're um, not volunteering that week, you've got, you know, all those thousand, you know, folks out there. That's brilliant. Um, Penny, or Helen, I'm sorry. Uh, I also believe in empowering staff. Firstly, select the best staff. Everyone who works at ACBC is genuinely passionate about the bilateral relationship and they're genuinely stimulated. China is in the paper every single day uh, and business is in the paper every day. So they are genuinely stimulated. So I also do not micromanage. I have a long leash for my staff and I empower them to do their job. And I also communicate. If you want to uh, implement an action plan, make sure you communicate with people and they will do their job 10 times faster. They know what the game plan is. <laughs> Amazing how that communication makes such a, such a difference. Andrew, what about you? I'd say the uh, answer is D, all of the above, because uh, I agree with everything yeah. that uh, has already been said. But uh, in an event, we, we ramp up from about 50 people throughout the year to 100 people at MotoGP yeah. and 150 at Formula One. And then we have... Um, you know, 600 suppliers. So it's exactly the same as what you're doing when you've got to get the message out to not only the staff and the temporary staff who are on for three months, three weeks or three days at the event or volunteers who are coming on. They've got to get the same passion that I have, that everyone in the business has. And you only do that by engagement, by leading by example, by getting around and, and encouraging people to enjoy what they do and do it in a way because there's plenty of other jobs but it's a special job that we all have. There's only one Mardi Gras in Australia, of, of maybe of note or in, in totality. We're on of only 21 Formula One events around the world. So it's something special, and that just needs to have the creative aspects of everyone brought out, and there's just special and different ways of doing it, and everyone's got different solutions to it. So it's a big team delivery, um, and you've got to have fun when you do it. Well, I would probably say fun at the end of the day is um, about the team. That's incredible. That's incredible. The fun you put out, you get back. Uh, Penny, how about yourself? I think it's all been said, so I might pass on the baton. <laughs> <laughs> Damien? Uh, we're we're a, a team of 11 uh, that uh, goes to a team of about 50 uh, for about six months of the year, and then there's 300 casual staff who are employed just to deliver our festival of, of ushers and stage managers and box office team. Um, a lot of those casual staff, we really have one day of training uh, and, and they're on, and, and I'm constantly marvelled about how on brand, uh, you know, excited, respectful, uh, committed to to the event that that, the, that that team are. That's partly about uh, the leadership team who return year on year. That we have some really great systems. Uh, what we what we're really focused on is, uh, you know, I I we are a fun organisation, and mm -hmm. and it, it's not always fun, of course, uh, when working in a major event. Um, but what we, we do have open lines of communication. We do support people's ideas. Um, but when it, when it comes down to event delivery, uh, we have some, some really uh, great systems in place to make sure that people are appropriately um, first recruited, but then trained and briefed and uh, and supported. You know, we're constantly adjusting and changing right through the festival. It's a 26-day festival, so we don't set and forget. Everything's, you know, changed and... and um, uh, and modified on a daily basis. <laughs> Constantly. And I think Therese prompted this. It'd be remiss of me to say it, it, it's also about investing in your staff from a training point of view, a development point of view, a career pathways point of view. Um, the mentoring was mentioned earlier on. Yes. Those are the sorts of things that people need as part of their careers. They all want to grow. They want to move through this industry. They want to achieve a variety of different things. And we've got to be keeping investing in, in our younger staff and even the ones who have been there for multiple years. 
And that, that may be one of the answers to this next question to, to wrap up this, uh, this session this morning. While we have these incredible leaders on stage, love for you to nominate your top one or top two key issues that this business of events sector should be focused on for growth in this coming year. What are the top one or two key issues you think the sector and everybody in this room needs to be focused on? Andrew. I think um, audience and understanding the audience deeply, um, connecting with them, I think it's an evolving audience, making sure you're staying, you know, up to date with the customer, so to speak, and, and you know, really utilising things like data um, in terms of the ability to, to really mine data now and the direction that's heading in and, and using those tools um, to make sure that you're, you're heading in the right direction and you're heading in, the, in sync with the customer base and the audience. Um, and the other one is just innovation. I think innovation is critical um, and, you know, that will certainly lead to success in the long term. But being genuine about innovation and, and actually creating a, a culture of innovation within your organisation and, and I think that aspect will, will hold Australian events in, in good stead into the future. Excellent. Therese? We're all running events and the world has changed. Um, we're now dealing with mass casualties, uh, heavy vehicle, vehicle mitigation and terrorism. And everyone that runs events now has to deal with that. It, it's become part and parcel of our event management and it's become part and parcel of, of everything that we need to do. It costs us money um, and we have to prepare uh, in a way that we never had to prepare before. So that's what we all need to be cognizant of. The other thing is don't let it get on top of you. You know, let this become part of our event management. Don't let it stop our innovation. Because we could go down a rabbit hole with, with like at the moment, if you think about the event that I run mm -hmm. with Mardi Gras, with 500,000 people on the tarmac, and we have to mitigate that tarmac against heavy vehicle mitigation. So that costs a lot of money. Build it into our budgets. Build, uh, uh, build risk into the budgets, um, but don't let it get on top of you. That's excellent. There's a terrific workshop this afternoon on safety and risk management, which is really not to be missed. Thank you, Therese. Helen. Well, we live in a globalised digital economy. Uh, it's almost borderless. So I, the three um, tips is language proficiency, appropriate digital um, uh, platforms um, and infrastructure. Uh, it's amazing how many people come up to us and say, you know, we're just not getting any hits on our website in China. And <laughs> they'll have an interface with Facebook or Insta and not realising that because of that they cannot get past the Chinese firewall. So really basic things like that, they're still cropping up in 2019. So appropriate digital stuff. Excellent. Andrew, top issues for growth in this uh, broadening broadening the footprint of both events beyond the three or four days that they exist mm. at the circuit so making it a year-round revenue earner for the for the state creating value for Victoria in a variety of different ways whether that's um, extension via history via tourism via um, virtual reality tours or even provision of advisory services and consulting services based on the competitive advantage that we have in the world of Formula One and motorsport it is nice to wear that competitive advantage Penny. For me, I'd love to see more innovation, and I know that this has been um, a hot topic for many years, but I think we get so caught up in the operational running of all of the events that we do that to extract ourselves and think about things outside of our industry, I think that could help us all. Interesting. Damien, key issue for growth. I'd say authenticity. Um, being really, you know, uh, audiences are savvy, consumers are savvy. So being really, you know, clear about your message and, and, and honest about what you're delivering, responsive if there are issues, um, people, can, people can sense bullshit. <laughs> and what a great note to end on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank your panel. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Truly event and life changing. Thank you.